I have some really, really bad news, okay? I'm friends with the, uh, with the chief of police in LaSalle, and uh, he just texted me a few minutes ago, and something crazy happened, okay? There was um, this zoo that was moving lions from the East Coast to the West Coast. And unfortunately, the trailer that was hauling this pride of lions overturned on Route 80 right north of here. And right now, there are 25 lions loose in LaSalle, Peru. Okay, now, just real quick, just real quick, okay? Suspend, suspension of disbelief for a minute, okay? If you're like, okay, this is real, okay? Just real quick for me, okay? If that story was true, okay? How many of you would leave this place differently today? Right? Like your natural plans of how you were just going to like meander out in a few minutes and you're like, you know, I'm just going to head out to the car. How many of you would be like, wait a second. <laughs> you would come to those front doors as you're exiting and you're like, can we, um, can we all like go together? Can we, can we stay? Can we go to the car? Can we just leave the... Can we just leave the doors locked? Can we put on a movie and just hang out for a while? Monitor the situation? Do we really need... I don't know if my next engagement really is as pressing as I thought it was to leave here today. Can we just hang out here? Kids are safe. They're locked in rooms. Maybe we should just stay here for a minute, right? Or you're like, well, Cameron, don't... Like, I need the updates, right? Like, if I was getting updates, you'd be like, tell me the newest information. Did they find a few? Are a few of them gone, right? If you're like, all of a sudden, missing dogs start getting reported. And you're like, oh my gosh, right? Some of you are like... Total change of plans. The reason why is because if there was a bunch of lions loose in LaSalle today as you were to exit this place, you would change up your strategy. You would, you would deeply want to know about the information and you would prepare because when there's danger like that, you would want to be prepared for. Now, that story, of course, is not true, but the real story is actually much worse that actually isn't that scary. It's scary, but you're like, we could prepare. We could know what to do. We have police officers. We have some of you guys, right? If you're like, you live in LaSalle, you're like, I'm going to go straight home, right? Full John Rambo, just guns and knives all over me. I'm set, right? You could make a plan pretty easy, but actually the reality of the situation is much worse. Peter, when he was writing to the church early on, he says, I need you to be cautious because there is a, a danger around you. And this is actually what he says. Check this out in 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. He says, stay alert, which is exactly what we would say if there was a bunch of lions loose, right? Stay alert. And he says this, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you are. He says, I need you to be really, really alert. You have an enemy. We call him the devil. And he said, if I could describe him in some way, he says, what I would say is it's like if there was a lion on the loose in your community. He said, a being that is way, way, way stronger than you physically, a being that is, is dangerous, has some serious weapons right on him, right? And, and I need you to stay alert to this devil. You see, the reality of this situation, I think, is actually much more dangerous than a bunch of lions being loose. And here's the problem. A lot of people who call themselves Christians, they aren't alert at all. They aren't alert at all. They're not walking around, living their life as if there is a roaring lion outside of their door, something prowling, trying to get them. And, and in all reality, much more dangerous than a lion. The lion only wants to take your body. This lion is interesting because he wants to devour your soul, not just ruin your physical body. He wants to take who you are. 
I need you to get this because actually this is a fascinating move that's happened in Christianity as of late. It's because uh, our kind of our a la carte world now where we think we can just take kind of pieces of what we believe and we can mash them all together. Um, and there are Christians now who say they are Christians, who say they believe in God, get this, that don't believe there really is a devil. That doesn't work. First of all, because like God says it, that there is a devil. Uh, but also, just practically, real quick, if there is no devil, uh, trying to explain the reality of the world around us makes basically no sense. I need you to get this, okay? There really is a devil. This is not a fairy tale. It's not like a fairy tale that you heard about, like, oh, there's this guy with the pitchfork and he's, you know, red suit and all this. No, there really is a devil. And it's interesting because actually that word devil, fascinatingly enough, you know what that word translates to? Accuser. One of the things they say in the Bible is the devil is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one who accuses you of sins over and over and over again in front of the heavenly hosts. Another name, of course, for him would be Satan, the, the evil one. The one who is created by God and then fell away, which is often why most people believe that the devil and Satan is none other than a man, not a man, excuse me, an angel named Lucifer. In the story of Revelation, there's this interesting character that we, we learn about named Lucifer, who was a created being, who was a, an angel, and he led a rebellion against God. That he rebelled against him and instead of serving and honoring God, wanted to take the honor for himself. And what it says is that he convinced a third of the heavenly host, a third of the angels, to reject God and say, we want to serve ourselves. And he propped himself up as this false god. In the story, God takes and throws him out of the courts of heaven onto the earth. And now he exists in the created earth with us until the end where Revelation says someday there is a pit of, of eternal fire and darkness made for the devil, for Lucifer and his angels, where they will be locked and chained forever. Of course, if you were from across the border down south, my brethren, El Diablo. El Diablo. He is real. And listen, I need you to get this. His purpose on this earth is to stop you loving God, to stop you trusting God. He despises God the creator. And in true sense, like to, to the deepest level, if you think about a, a true hatred in somebody, by proxy, he now hates you because God's word says we are made in God's image. So when he looks at you, it reminds you of the God he despises. When he looks at you, he, he wants to make sure that he, he destroys and pulls your life away from the goodness of God. In fact, what the devil wants you to do is he wants to steal your attention away from God and turn it inward to yourself. And he says, make yourself a God instead of serving the God, the created one. Become like me, Satan, who turned and made himself God. His purpose is to get you to stop trusting him, to stop loving him. But I need you to understand this. This is one of the things that is, is good news about this, this devil. The good news is, is he's outnumbered. It says that he took a third of the angels, which to me sounds terrible, except you go, wait a second, that means there's two thirds of the angels left on our side. Not only that, but he's outgunned. Very often, people will describe God and Satan almost like they're like these two halves, like fighting back and forth, like evil powers against each other who are equally matched, and, and that's not the case at all. In fact, I need you to get the fact that the devil is a created being by God. God's characteristics, it says that he is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Now, those are some really big words, but it's pretty simple. It means that he is everywhere, he knows everything, and can do anything. Real quick, Satan is not. He is not. Sometimes people are like, well, the devil was tempting me. And it's like, I get the colloquialism, but like, no, he wasn't. The devil runs his army just like that, an army. 
The devil cannot be in all places at all times. The devil does not know all things. The devil is not all powerful. And what we see in God's word is what he is, is he's the leader. He's the general and he has all these demons. And what he's doing is he's the guy calling the shots, sending out battalions of demons to go and oppress the brethren, to accuse the brethren, to try to to bring chaos into people's lives. And these reports are coming in. In fact, it even says in the Bible, the idea of like these demons coming and going from places, that they have to go back and report to Satan in the spiritual realm, then go back out, and he's divvying up and sending them across the world to be the accuser. You see, the devil, devil is powerful, which you get really scared of, but the other part that's interesting about him is he's very, very predictable. The devil's competent, but he's, he's not creative. In fact, when I started thinking about this and getting prepared for this series, I realized like the the big thing behind all of this, of us insulating ourselves against the attacks the devil would try to bring into our life, is the fact that the devil's attacks have one fatal flaw. Just one that I can find. Maybe there's more. But there's one that I can recognize in God's word. I can recognize by just being a pastor for a handful of years and talking to people. His attacks have one major flaw. They lack creativity. They lack creativity. Why do I say this? Well, let's look back at those verses real quick where where Peter was talking about this. He says this, Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world, so all the rest of us who are believers, is going through the same kind of suffering you are. He said, I need you to understand, and this isn't like picking on you, but you're not special. He's like, the same stuff that's happening to you, believers everywhere around the world, same attacks, same basic strategy that he's putting in place, you're facing the same kind of suffering that everyone else is. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, Paul one time where he was talking to the church about this idea of facing against the devil, he says this in 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. When you forgive this man, who is someone associated with the church, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit. He says this, I do this so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Paul says, you know the great part about the devil? We are very familiar with his schemes. They aren't a surprise to us at all. That was a few thousand years ago. And he says, the schemes of the devil, they are not surprising. In fact, they are familiar. It's the same thing over and over and over again. In fact, that's what I have found. The devil attacks at the same times over and over and over and over again. They lack creativity. Now, why? Why would the devil use the same attacks over and over? Well, the first one is really, really simple, okay? We keep falling for them. The first reason why he uses the same attacks over and over again is because we keep falling for him. Same story, same thing, over and over and over again. 2,000, not 2,000, maybe more, 4,000 years ago, or 3,000 years ago, uh, it was a man walking on a roof and he saw a woman bathing on another roof. Today, it's just like your iPhone. Same strategy, though. Same strategy. It's the same attack. And we just keep falling for them. Not only across the generations, but even you. Can we be honest for a second? So many of the things that the devil, that the the evil force against God brings into your life, it's not brand new crazy things, is it? You're like, man, like I never saw that one coming. Never saw that one coming. It's the same junk you've been struggling with your whole life, isn't it? It's the same one. You're like, dealt with this one before. Here it comes around again. Same temptation coming back again. Same problem coming back again. We keep falling for the same thing. So, of course, the devil, he's just efficient. Don't change the play. If it's working, run the same play, right? First down, run it again. First down, run it again. First down, run it again. Touchdown. Awesome. Yep, marriage destroyed. All right, on to the next one, right? We just keep falling for him, so he keeps running them. But, but here's this too, and this is why I truly do believe what I'm saying isn't just a feeling. 
When I say that his attacks lack creativity is he has no source of creativity. Creativity is the ability to create. That comes from God. Correct. God is the only source of creativity. In fact, if I may, any of you creatives out there, I need you to get what you're tapping into is a God characteristic that we carry because we're image bearers of his. When we can creatively solve a problem, when we can, in our mind, dream up a new idea, let me tell you where that comes from. That's a little bit of God's character sitting inside of you as his creation. But listen, when the devil rebelled against God, he cut himself off from that creativity. The devil can't create anything. In fact, think real quick for me. All of his attacks are basically just asking you to use something that God created in a way that God doesn't want it to be used. God didn't, or Satan, he didn't create money, right? Value. That's something that God built into the universe. And Satan's like, yeah, use that for your own lustful pleasures. Satan didn't create sex. God created sex. Satan's like, yeah, but I want you to use it in a different way than, you know, God designed Satan didn't design all these different pieces of our life. He, God designed them. He's the creator. Satan just asks us to misuse them. So I need you to get this, okay? The devil, he attacks in the same way over and over and over again. In fact, what I'm going to do is um, this week, and then I got two more weeks kind of interspersed over this next month. I'm going to show you three key times of when the devil attacks, and here's why this is so important, okay? And, and just to be raw with you for a second. The reason behind this message series is now, 13 years as the pastor of this church, four years of pastoring college students before that, and honestly where it comes from is just Heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak. Ministry is like the best thing in the world because you get to see people fall in love with Jesus and you get to see people, man, freed from addictions and move forward into purpose in their life and walk away from depression and, and all these different amazing things. But the ministry is the worst too. It's the worst, too, because what you see is then you see people begin down that path, and then you just see the devil come and just rip them apart, and you never see him again. And it's heartbreaking to watch people just get shredded by our enemy, the devil. And I don't want that to be your story. I've already had way too many people disappear. Way too many sheep get ate by the devil. And I would much rather you have at your foundation an understanding of his attacks so you could bulletproof your life against the next time the devil comes. Friends, I'm telling you, the devil will attack soon in your life. But my hope today, listen, in these next few weeks, is if you get this, you could actually be prepared for these attacks and they won't catch you off guard. They won't catch you off guard. You'll be ready for them. My prayer is that in years to come, this will be the foundation of why you still are a Jesus follower. So with that said, I want to jump into the first time that we see when the devil attacks over and over and over again. The devil will attack when you are just getting started. Just getting started. We see this over and over again in the Bible. The devil shows up whenever something begins, Whenever something is just getting started, in fact, we literally see it in the very first book of the Bible, in Genesis, it says this, in Genesis 3, 1 through 4, the devil appears and he takes this image of the serpent. It says this, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Which is a lie. Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it, and if you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Now, 
Why did I jump to this verse? Because I think it is proof that the devil showed up early on in the story. God, is, God creates, he makes man and woman in his image. And then the story of the devil shows up and you might say, well, how do we know that that happened early? And I would say this verse right here. Because Eve hadn't even had her first child. And if this was the reality, that couldn't have taken long, right? <laughs> Just saying, right? If any of you are tired of your husband's always trying to paw at you when he walks by, a thousand times more worse, right, in regards to this. Before she even has her first kid, the devil already shows up in creation. He doesn't wait for a long time. He doesn't wait for generations. We're talking right away. He shows up and he tries to get them to sin and turn away from God. He doesn't wait for a long time into the story. He shows up in literally Genesis 3. Now, we also see this just practically throughout the story of the Bible. When, when people who were born, who shifted people's connections with God, the devil would show up and try to do something. In fact, probably the greatest character in the Old Testament was a man named Moses. The moment that Moses was born, it was fascinating. The king at the time put out an edict that said, no more of these uh, Israelite boys. You need to kill all of them when they're born. We don't want any more of them. And Moses, the devil tried to kill him while he was still an infant. He didn't wait until Moses grew up. He tried to murder him while he was still an infant. And in fact, we see the same story done again when Jesus is born. It says this in Matthew 2, 13 and 16. This is a story of when Jesus came. This is the, the story of the wise men or the Magi. It says, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And in fact, the Magi were told by God, go a different way. Don't tell the king at the time about where Jesus is. And a few verses later, it says this, Herod was furious when he realized the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and younger based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. When Jesus was born and they show up and they say, we're here to, to worship the king, the devil touches Herod's heart and he doesn't wait until Jesus grows up and starts becoming this, this preaching force. He touches Herod's heart right at the beginning and he says, just murder Jesus now while he's still an infant. Find any boy under two years old in this area where Jesus is prophesied to be and slaughter all of them. And that's exactly what he does in the area. He kills all of the boys who are two years and under, but the Lord spoke to Joseph and they left the area before it happened. You see, the devil shows up when a story is just getting started. He doesn't wait for it to play out. He shows up right at the beginning because he knows this is where you cut off a story at the beginning. You don't let it play out. In fact, Jesus basically taught this too. One time he was teaching his, his men and he used parables all the time, right? Jesus did this where it's a story that's not really true, but it represents something. He says there's these farmers who would go out and they would scatter seed. And when they scatter seed, it fell on four different kinds of soil. Some soil, it was just like this path and birds would come and just peck them right away. And, and some soil, it was shallow and it would spring up, but the sun would come out and it would torch it. And some were amongst weeds, so they grow up and then the weeds would, would overwhelm it. And then some was in good soil and it would grow up and produce an amazing crop and everyone's like, oh yeah, amazing, right? It's amazing teaching. But it's so great too because I love how real the Bible is because they basically like leave that area and I'm sure all the disciples were like, yes, yeah, good teaching, Jesus. They leave and the disciples literally go like, we have no clue what you were talking about, Jesus. Like what was that whole seed thing? Are you giving like agriculture tips? What is like, don't plant your seed on a path? What is this? And Jesus goes, this whole thing is a picture of what we do as believers, he actually explains it in this, Mark 4, 14 through 15. He says, the farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. It's the truth of who God is. That's what the seed is. And he says this, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. 
Jesus actually says there are tons of people who they are going to hear the gospel, they are going to hear the good news and listen to me. Satan is wise enough to know the right time to attack is when someone's just getting started. So he says, you're going to share that good news, share that gospel, share that wisdom, and right away the devil is going to send demons to come and say, gather all that up and get rid of it. Don't let any of that stay around. Throw doubt on every bit of that. Tear all that away and make sure they don't have time to sit on that and think about that. You see, the devil shows up when we are just getting started. Now, why? Because when we're just getting started, there are no wins to point to yet. You see, when we're just getting started, we don't have any milestones yet to mark. Everything is still so chaotic and nebulous. We don't really know what's coming next. So we don't have any wins underneath of our belt yet. He understands that. But not only that, the devil attacks when we're just getting started because if I may, he wants to keep you right where you are. You know, the fascinating part about God's word, the longer I've been in it and the longer I've read it, is that like faithfulness to God is like this constant movement forward. It's this God always calling you to something greater than you even expect, giving you more responsibility, giving you more blessing, giving you more uh, you know, finance, giving you more opportunity, giving you more relationships that you really think you can handle. And the whole point is that he's always drawing you forward into something that's kind of beyond yourself, greater than yourself, so that you're always looking at God and going, I think I need a hand with this. This is greater than I expected. This is a greater calling than I expected. This is a greater purpose than I ever expected. This is more than I ever expected, that God is drawing us into that. But see, the devil, he wants to keep you seated right where you are, where he knows he can find you where he knows he can run the same play over and over and over again in your life. And you see, that's why the devil attacks when we're just getting started, because when you take that first step, I think it sets off bells in the spiritual world. And the devil says, extra demons on that guy, on that girl right now. Why? Because she's only one step away from where she used to be. You know what's really easy right now? Grab a hold of her and drag her back to that place she just was. Because it's not going to feel like that much of a step back, but that's where we know how to get her. Don't let her move forward. Don't let him move forward. Push her back. Push him back right now and keep them where they were. What I've seen over and over and over again is the devil attacks when we're just getting started because he doesn't want us to have any impact and gain those wins. I've seen it like this. Someone will give their lives to Jesus and immediately their life will get harder, not easier. Because the devil's like, well, we got to stop this right now, right now. Someone will start praying for their marriage and chaos will explode inside of it. I remember this years ago, Amy and I, a couple, we started praying for their marriage. A week later, we get this message. Yeah, he's moving out. We're like, what? What? We just started praying for this, and it's, it's, get, it's getting worse. What's going on? Someone will join a team or join a group or take their very first step of not just being in the crowd in church, but saying, I'm really going to be a part of this. And as soon as that happens, all of a sudden, the, the kids will get sick. The car will break down. Something will come that brings chaos, and it's like, oh, man, I, I guess I got to just step back from that. I can't, I can't do that. Someone will start giving generously for the first time ever, beginning to believe that their finances have a bigger purpose, and then they'll get a bill they didn't expect or something will break. Someone will try a spiritual discipline for the first time, stepping out into a new opportunity like reading God's word for the first time, fasting for the first time, praying consistently for the first time, trying to root out sin, and all of a sudden, temptation will just abound that next month like crazy. You see, the devil attacks when we're just getting started. And it convinces us that that step forward maybe wasn't the right time. Maybe that wasn't the right thing. Maybe that wasn't the right step right now. And I need you to get that so that you can respond to it correctly. Now, what can you do? 
Because I don't just want to be like, yeah, here's a situation. It sucks. Bye, guys. That's not what I want you to have today. I want you to have something that you can do. And Paul brings really great wisdom to the situation one time where he was talking about facing this enemy that we have. Here's what he says in Ephesians. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. He says, we kind of know the strategies of the devil, and I need you to be prepared for this. And here's what he says. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. He says this, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Isn't that cool? He literally says there will be a clear time where the devil will attack. There will be a time of evil, a predictable time of evil. And you then need God's armor to be prepared. And he says, then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. He says, there really is a devil. He really will attack. And what you need is you need armor when this time of attack comes. Now, it's cool because he lists out multiple different pieces of armor. What I'm going to do is each week, I'm going to show you the ones that apply to the time when the devil attacks. For you, maybe more like note takers, this is so much fun. You get to jot stuff down, draw little notes next to it, any of that stuff so you can remember it. But when the devil attacks, when we're just getting started, I will tell you what we need. We need Ephesians 6, 14, and he says this, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, and the body armor of God's righteousness. Another term for that is the breastplate of righteousness, which is like an old chain mail or old steel covering that would go over you to keep you safe. Listen, when the devil attacks, when we're just getting started, this is what we need because what you're going to do is you're going to take one step forward and then the devil's going to try to smack you in the face. And in that moment, I need you to stand your ground. Not get pushed back. You took that one step, and I need you to stay planted there in that moment, standing your ground. And he says, here's the answer. A belt made of truth and a breastplate made of righteousness. So what does this mean, okay? First of all, the belt of truth. The reason why you need a belt made of truth to surround you is because as soon as you take that first step, one of the biggest things the devil will use as an attack against you is lies. Lies. As soon as you take that step to begin praying for that, to begin giving in that way, to begin moving in that way, to begin planning in that way of what God has for you, the devil will show up and he will immediately start saying lies to you like this. It's never going to happen. It's not going to work. You're not going to make it. You can't do this. And he'll start whispering those things into your ear. And the reason why I'm telling you they're lies is because, again, the devil's not omniscient. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He knows no more than you do about it. You're like, you're there and you take a step and he goes, you're never going to make it to where you're going. You're never going to make it to there. But that's a lie because he doesn't know either. He's just assuming that if you listen to him, you're going to take that step back and you're going to stay where you were. I need you to get the fact that when you hear those words, those are the words of the devil and they are a lie. He does not know your future. Only God knows your future. And in this moment, you need to wrap yourself around with, with truth and you need to be able to speak that truth so you can keep moving forward. You need something like Philippians 4.13. So when you hear those lies, you can say this, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. God's word says that I can do everything as long as it's through Christ who gives me strength. If he's calling me to do it, we can accomplish it if he's the path by which I'm going to it. And you need to be able to speak truth in that moment when you hear those lies come to you. It's kind of like, it's what keeps your pants on. So they don't fall down and you don't stumble and just stay where you're at. 
He needs to hold you together. Is a good source of truth wrapped up, keeping you, keeping you held together so that you can stand your ground and not get knocked back as soon as you take that first step. But he also says you need this. You need a, a breastplate made of righteousness. And this is the, the other half of this because, you know, the, the really hard part about what the devil will do when he attacks is first of all, he'll tell lies, like I just said, right? He'll tell lies. You're never going to make it. You're never going to do this. You know, you're never going to accomplish this. And, and those are lies. But you know what's even worse about the devil's attacks is he'll actually come and he'll say stuff that's true. Instead of just the lie of what you can't be, what he'll do is he'll come and he'll say, you tried this before. Oh, you, you tried to get sober before. It didn't work. Oh, yeah, I, I know. That's great that you're going to do that. But, but do you really think that that makes up for all of the garbage you've done in your life? Well, I'm going to believe this. And the devil says, you give up on everything. And see, the really scary part is, is first the enemy will attack with lies, but then what he'll start to do is he'll start to throw these flaming arrows of truth. He'll bring back up your past. He'll bring back up your own unrighteousness. And they'll lodge like arrows inside of your heart. And it's interesting, there's that terminology that says like basically when you give up on something, they call it losing heart losing heart. Like you don't have any, any more that something could happen because you just lost heart. And what he says is what you need is you need like an ironclad cover to protect your heart. But here's the problem. This bless, breastplate, excuse me, is made of righteousness and we have none. We have none. He said, what you need to cover your heart is righteousness. But there's a problem, friends. We don't have any righteousness. We don't have any. And in fact, you know, it's actually amazing because I thought about that when I was reading this and I actually noticed, you know what's fascinating about that verse in Ephesians? He says, put on every piece of God's armor. And he says this, that what you should put on is the belt of truth but it says this, it doesn't say the breastplate of righteousness, it says the breastplate of God's righteousness. How awesome is that? He said the breastplate isn't made of your own righteousness, it's made of his righteousness. What you put on is you put on his righteousness to protect your heart. You see, the reality is, is the devil will come and he will say things in your mind like you are a failure, you've failed at everything you've tried. You are a phony. This is pretend. You are not a good person. Stop pretending like you are. And in order for those things not to lodge in your heart and destroy the progress, what you need is you need Christ's righteousness over you that you can say, yeah, everything that you said is true. But, but, I'm not moving forward based on my own righteousness. I'm moving forward based on Jesus's. You see, in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says this, God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right. That means gifted righteousness with God through Christ. He says, for any of us who have put our trust in Jesus, he gives us his righteousness as a gift. And as we accept his gift of righteousness, all of that sin and shame that's in our past, we can let go of it because the king of the universe has forgiven us and has put us in right relationship with God. When all of those sayings come against us and the things the devil has said against us, we can say, well, everything you said might be true. But you see, my life isn't based on my own righteousness. It's based on Jesus's and I'm gonna believe that he can carry me through. You see, the devil will attack when you are just getting started. He's going to show up and he's going to jump into that moment. And, and here's why this is so important for you to know, okay? Because 
If you know that the devil will attack when you are just getting started, then you can start with even more attack. If you know the devil is going to attack when you're just getting started, then you can get started with a whole different level of attack. Because if you recognize this, then that means you can be prepared. Listen to me. If you decide, you know what? I think God is calling me to blank. I think God is asking me to blank. I think God has this purpose for my life. You as a Christian should recognize the second I start making progress forward, the devil is going to show up and try to stop me. But I need you to get this. This is why it's so important. Because if you recognize that, you can resist it. And after you resist it, listen, the devil's going to ease up again. The devil only has so many demons. He only has so many forces to be able to allocate. So what happens is, is you take that first step forward. The devil sets off all the alarms. He says, go and get that guy. Go and get that girl. Push them back to where they were. Make sure they don't make any progress. But if you know that he's showing up, you take that step. Bad things start happening. You go, I already knew this was going to come. I already knew this struggle was going to happen because I'm moving forward. And you press through the second step and the third step and the fourth and the fifth. Very momentarily, there will come a time where then the devil will say, all right, never mind. Pull off that guy. Pull off that girl. There's someone else just taking their first step. That person is a lost cause. They already have wins under their belt. They're already miles away from where we know that we could get them. Now I have to re-strategize a whole new formula because they're not even the same person they were a year ago. So we have to start over. Pull those guys. Go see this person because this person is just getting started. And the reason why I need you to get that is because if you press through that moment, all of a sudden you'll get to the other side and you're like, oh, feels like all of a sudden stuff is straightened out again in my life. And you're like, right. Because see, the devil has that special attack right when you're just getting started. This is why this is important. Listen to me, friends. There are a whole bunch of you in this next year, in this next season of your life, you're going to feel God is going to call you something and you're going to step out into it and you are going to be tempted to be like, it's not working. It's not working. It's getting worse. It's not working. Stuff is falling apart. And if I may, friend, I would say in that moment, you've only tried it for like a week or two. You see, like, we all have this tendency. We're like, I'm going to do this thing. And we step out into it. I'm going to try this thing. And we step out into it. And we get like 30 days into it. And we're like, it's not working. And you're like, well, wait a second. It took 10 years for you to build this mess. Are you surprised that it's not fixed in 30? Like 30 days and it's, it's not done? If we get this, here's what would be awesome. Christians would be the people who never quit in the first week. Who never give up on month one of a new journey. Who never stop after the first season and they're like, well, nothing's happening. We would be the people who go, well, of course it's going to get harder before it gets better. The devil always attacks when you just start something new. When you're just getting started, oh, that's the hardest time. You have to work twice as hard when you're just getting started because the devil's going to attack like crazy. But soon, very soon, you'll come past that first step and that next step and that next step. And then all of a sudden you'll realize, wow, I'm in an entirely different place and the devil is no longer attacking like he once did. Here's what I want for you today. First of all, for some of you, you're going to start again. Some of you started something, you stopped because it got harder, it got more difficult. And today you need to realize you didn't experience like, oh, I must have been doing something wrong. All you were experiencing is just exactly what all of us experience. As soon as you step out to do something right, the devil's going to show up and attack and today, there's something that's been in your heart. There's something that's been on your mind. And you're going to decide today to start again. I'm going to start again. But this time, I know the devil is going to attack. So I'm going to have something for him. I'm going to have the belt of truth around me. I'm going to have the breastplate of righteousness over me when he starts attacking my heart and remind myself of my righteousness is not based on my own. It's based on Jesus' gift. 
For some more of you right now today, listen, I need you to put this in long-term memory. This isn't a short-term memory message. Long-term memory message. I need you to file away the devil attacks when you're just getting started. Your friends are going to tell you about something in their life, and they're going to say, like, oh, I just did this, and all of a sudden this happened, and you're going to go, well, of course that happened. The devil always attacks when you're just getting started. He always does. And listen, for some more of you, I pray that this week and the next couple weeks, I pray that you are going to find peace. Because you would think this message series would make you scared, right? You're like, there's, there's a lion out there. He's trying to eat you. But that's exactly the opposite of what I want you to experience during this message series. Instead, what I want you to experience is that you would go, oh, I know there's a lion out there, but I know his tactics. I know when he shows up, and I'll have something ready for him. And for you to have a peace like never before where you're like, I'm not saying he's not a big deal. He's real. But I know his tactics, and I'll be prepared. And that's my hope. Like I said, that for you who are here, I don't want to see any one of you dragged off and destroyed by the devil. Would you do me a favor? Would you bow your head, close your eyes for a second as we finish this message? God, I pray today that you would send your Holy Spirit to bring heart, that heart that you give because you cover our heart with your righteousness. I pray, God, that maybe there have been some people, even just recently that they did this, they stepped out into something and immediately the devil just started beating them up and, and they got scared. They stepped back. They fell back to who they, who they were and they thought, I guess maybe this is just who I'm meant to be. And I pray today, God, you would touch their hearts and you would say, there's so much more, son. There's so much more, daughter. I pray that it would give a peace and a courage like never before as we understand this and that you really would. You would just bulletproof our faith we would be conscious and we would know our enemy and we would be prepared for him. God, I pray if there's any who never experienced that, that righteousness gifted to them right now, just like you said, Jesus, that you give us a gift of righteousness. I pray in their heart right now, they might just kind of lay their soul bare and say, Jesus, forgive me. I want that righteousness. Come be the king of my life. Forgive me. Make me new. Make me right with God. And I pray as they pray that prayer in their heart, you would come in and you would just wipe away the sins of their life and you would gift them that righteousness. God, make us stronger so that we can go and we can change this world. We can show people your love, our communities, our families to know you like never before. In Jesus' name, amen.